God, great people, great church. And uh, I, I think this morning, um, one of the things that, that we can't help but miss and focus on is the great God. Uh, for the great God is our purpose for gathering here today. And I think that I said this throughout this series, we cannot be a great people, nor could we be a great church without first having a great God. Amen? Amen. And so certainly, uh, everything that we have discussed from you know, worship to ministry, uh, evangelism, fellowship, discipleship, and community, not, none of this can happen the way that it is supposed to happen unless we focus our attention upon God. We, you know, sometimes we just need to get our, our, our focus off of ourselves and on to God. And when we can begin to do that, we will certainly be a great people and a great church. Well, I do want to uh, draw your attention to the back of the bulletin here this morning. And uh, we're going to look at our purpose statement uh, one more time. And we'll just read that uh, together in unison as a group. Our purpose, to make a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission and the great community in order to make a great church. All right, and then we have the verses there, uh, Matthew 22, 37 through 40 is where we find the uh, great commandment. Uh, and uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is where we find the great commission. And then the great community is found there in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 44. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, uh, becoming a great community. One of the things that I was amazed as I was preparing uh, for this series and, and looking at the direction uh, that we were headed is I don't normally uh, uh, keep track of all the people that um, um, call the church and asking for help and, and what help we as a church are able to give. Uh, you know, not just those, not just those that are part of our local church body community, but the uh, greater community as well. And so this this past month, I started keeping track of of all those that called and whether our church was able to help or not. And I was able to identify uh, ten different times. That equals to about two and a half uh, calls a week of people calling the church, needing some sort of help. And uh, our church was able to help offer some sort of assistance. Sometimes it wasn't even financial. For example, uh, we had some uh, uh, a family. Uh, this was a family within our church that their um, water pump had went out. And uh, we were able to get them the necessary tools to be able to uh, fix the, the water pump. We had uh, um, uh, someone call affiliated with DHS. Uh, that needed um, some clothing and, and beds and, and um, uh, kitchen supplies and those types of things, and, and the church came alongside and, and helped them out. Uh, we had another individual call that needed help with the, um, uh, their furnace had went out, and the uh, church kicked in some money for the repair of that. We had people that needed uh, help uh, getting to a doctor's appointment um, a couple of different times, some gas appointments to different places. And the church has jumped in and has been a part of helping. And when I think about community and, and where we're going today as a service, I think this all fits into that. And, um, you know, one of the, sometimes when you begin to talk about those that we're able to help and the things that we're able to do, people will say, oh, you got to be careful because if you start letting people know that, uh, you know, that you're giving out money for different things, for different repairs and things like that, more people are going to want and, and, and then you're not going to have enough to give. Well, I tell you what, in the community of faith, I found just the opposite to be true. When you begin to talk about, as, as a church, how we want to help those that are out in the community, and even within the local church body, I find that there's more and more people that want to be a part of that. Uh, they want to support that. And, and uh, you know, if, if anybody here at our church would, you know, have a need, we are a community. And I'd like to see ourselves uh, to, to be the type of community that they had there in the Acts chapter 2. Uh, the scripture that I have written there in your bulletin is, all the believers were together.
together and had everything in common. I know that, uh, I, well, I won't give names, but uh, there was a time that my wife had hit a deer with her car, and there was a family member here at this church that gave us a car to use uh, and, until we could get a new car. And uh, then there was another time that my car was in a shop, and, and uh, I had somebody call me and say, hey, I hear your car's in the shop. I'm like, yeah. And I said, well, do you, um, you know, God has a car in my garage, and you are more than welcome to use it. I thought, well, praise the Lord. And I was like, no, no, I think I'll be just fine. I, I don't think that I can go. Well, lo and behold, later that day, I need to go somewhere. And, and so she got God's car out of her garage, and she let me drive it around. I thought, how wonderful if we were to look at our vehicles, our homes, our, our stuff as not being our stuff, but it's God's stuff. And he intends to use it for, for his ministry. I know there's been times that we were taking the youth to different places, uh, celebrate life, and someone let us use a, a great big giant suburban to be able to take them back and forth, you know, and say, you know, and the, the owner of the vehicle didn't even go, but they said, this is, this is God's vehicle. I want it to be used for God's kingdom and, and God's glory. And so if we began to look at everything that we have or have possession of, as being belonging to God and not being our own, then we will be much more better. When, when I was a youth pastor, we, uh, you know, we get a youth group and we sit around. I, I used to pull out this book, and, and the book uh, would ask a number of different discussion questions to kind of get the group talking. You know, sometimes when you, sometimes teens, you can never get them to shut up. Other times, you need something to, to kind of break the ice and, and get some things going. And uh, there was one particular question that uh, tend to reappear a number of different times. The, the version of the question was a little bit uh, different, but the question always uh, seemed to reappear time and time again was the question about being on a deserted island. You know, and, and uh, you know, for example, if you were on a deserted island and could take one thing with you, what would that one thing be? You know, of course, then you've got this young couple that's in love, and the boy says, if I could take one thing, I would take her. You know, everybody's like, oh, make us puke. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know young teenagers that know all about love, isn't it wonderful? You know, just coming off of Valentine's Day. And then there would be the one, you know, uh, one kid that would say the perfect answer, boy, if I could take one thing with me, I'd take my Bible. You know, and everybody's like, yeah, really right, you know. You know, you know, that's the perfect Sunday school answer. You know, the, the kid that's gone to church all of his life that lives like a pagan, you know, he, he knows all the right answers when he's at church, you know, but get him on the outside. You know, that'd be a great answer if that was true, but so often it's not. And uh, so over the years, there's been a lot of, of stories and, and jokes and television so, uh, shows centered on the idea of being stranded on an island. And probably one of, one of my favorite stories of being stranded on the island is, is Gilligan's Island. You guys remember Gilligan's Island? Uh, what, a, what a great show. I think by the time I came around, I, I think we were watching reruns of Gilligan's Island. But then, you know, my brothers and sisters and I, we'd get together and get around the television show. And if I remember right, it came on right after the Brady Bunch, which was another awesome, you know, television program that, that came on. But, um, you know, I, I think what made Gilligan's Island um, so unique and, and funny was the different personalities of each of the castaways. Uh, you remember the skipper? Uh, he was smart and fearless. He knew how to take charge and, and lead a group. Uh, there were the howls. They were filthy rich. And they knew how to handle anything that required uh, a knack for business and administration. Uh, there was also Mary Ann. Uh, she was the comforter, the encourager, always ready with a, you know, a, a coconut pie for anyone that was having any type of trouble or feeling down. And then uh, the professor, I think, is one of my favorites. You know, he kind of reminded me of MacGyver. You guys remember watching MacGyver? That's another great television program. But you know, he could figure out anything and make any anything out of you know coconuts and a few wires and. You know, the only thing he couldn't figure out was how to get off the island. But uh, he could do everything else, you know, but that. Then there was um, uh, Ginger. 
that could act and she could get them out of whatever jam, uh, you know, if someone else came to the island. It seemed like people were coming and going from the island all the time, but Gilligan and his crew, they just kept getting stuck there. I never could figure out why can you guys never get off of this stinking island? Everybody else is coming and going. And then there was Gilligan. You know, Gilligan was the one that had a servant's heart. And uh, he would try to do anything for anyone. And, uh, you know, a lot of time in his quest to help somebody, he ends up messing it up. You ever have somebody, you know, do that normally? If you've got kids, you know what I'm talking about. They're, you know, they try to help and then things end up getting broken sometimes. Maybe, maybe little kids. I see my daughter looking at me funny. Little, little kids, not, uh, not teenagers. But anyways, it was a, it was a great program. Uh, and it was also a great picture of community. They, they survived because they each complemented each other's strength. They worked together, and because of that, they were able to handle whatever each new episode would challenge them with. They each had a sense of belonging, and their gifts and talents were important. They, they each felt that sense of support uh, that the others provided, and their lives were intertwined together. Uh, when Gilligan got upset and fell in love, he would move to the other side of the island in a and live in a cave by himself. Uh, he quickly realized that he couldn't survive without the support of the others. And he had lost that sense of whole wholeness that comes through community. He knew that he needed the rest of the group and that together they could accomplish things that they could never do alone. This is a great picture of community for us today. A community is a group of people who, while maintaining their individuality and uniqueness, but they come together as one to live life together and move towards one goal. In their case, to get off the island. In our case, to advance the kingdom of God. That's what we're seeking to do here as a church and, and why our final um, core value here this morning is community. Uh, that together we can work, we can minister, we can help to advance the kingdom of God. Uh, this is the kind of community and togetherness that we see in the early church and what we can see taking place even here. But the question is, how does it begin? Uh, you know, how do we get and, and build a community? And what I want to look at as we, you know, as just as we have made a commitment to each of these four values, how we can make a commitment to community. And there are a couple of building blocks to community that I want to uh, look at this morning. But for our purposes today, we'll define community as a unified body of individuals with common character and common interest who share joint ownership and participation in something. See, the early church fit this definition, but what was it that really made them a community? And Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 44, tells us the two in, uh, essential ingredients to building community. Two things that were the foundation of the development of community in this Acts chapter 2 church. Boy, I, I wish that we could you know, take some time and, and, and read maybe the first three or four chapters of the book of Acts, but, you know, maybe that's something that you can do on your, on your own, and I would encourage you to do that, to really get a sense of how important community was to this group of people. And so what we find here are the building blocks of community, but in defining and, and finding these building blocks, we can't overlook what God does. I mean, community is not something that can be manufactured with people. It's, it's God-ordained. It's God-driven. Everything that we do, God has to be the center of that ideal or that goal, or it has to be given by God himself. And so as we seek to build community, we should never um, overlook God because he will work to convict and to change us and to call us into action and the ministry. He will be the one that blesses our efforts and, and works in and through us. 
See, God wants to bless what he is doing. So often we're asking God to bless what we're doing. Have you ever thought about that? When you're asking for the blessings of God, when, when you're going out and there's something that you want to do and you're asking God to, Lord, would you bless this? Lord, would you bless this? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, Lord, what are you blessing that you want to be a part of? Have you ever thought of approaching it that way instead of asking God to bless what you're doing? To ask God what he wants you to do so that he might truly bless it. In the early church, it was very clear that God was the one working through them. It was God that added to their number. It was God that was the agent of change and growth. But those things won't happen here until we change and that we decide that this is something worth working toward. Is community going to be important for this church? Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 44. If you've got your, uh, uh, one of the few Bibles, you certainly can find it in there. It's on page uh, 1079. Uh, I would encourage you to go ahead and look for that because there's several, several verses around there that we're going to be looking at here this morning. But in Acts chapter 2, verse 44, it says, All the believers were together and had everything in common. See, the building blocks are contained in this very simple, and it's very easy to read verse. To be a community, we must have togetherness and we must have common ground. These are the essentials on our part. When those two things aren't there, we're, we're just spinning our wheels. We're ineffective and our ministry is in vain. But when we have those two things, we are a, a truly a reflection of God. We are an extension of his love and goodness, and we can accomplish his purpose for us as individuals and for us as a unified church body. So the first building block that we want to look at together is togetherness. Now, here's where I'm going to maybe start to sound a little bit redundant as I say this over and over, is that we are not made to do this on our own. We are not made to do this on our own. When we talk about discipleship and fellowship and, and, and evangelism and ministry and worship, none of these things are meant to do on our own, but are made to do in a context of a community. Now you would say, I can do all these things on my own, and certainly, to, to a certain extent, there are some of the things that you can do on your own, but the... the but for us, we want to do these things in the context of a community because we know that real life change happens in the context of community. And that's what we want to be as a community. We were made for relationship. And the church is God's plan to satisfy that need within all of us. Uh, we don't have an instant of the saints in the New Testament being encouraged to go it alone or to isolate themselves from the rest of the body. It just never happened in the early church. They were to do it together. They are taught again and again that to accept Christ is to become a part of a family, to be part of the body of Christ. And just as the scripture tells us that, you know, some are the hands, some are the feet, you know, some, some, some are the body, but Christ is the head. And you don't want to go without any of the parts of the body. So when, when a part is disconnected from the body, it shrivels up and it dies. It is only as a part of the whole that we can experience and fulfill God's purpose in our life. And so throughout the New Testament, you see the word church used, and, and only in a few important instances is it used to refer to the entire body of believers. Almost without exception, it is the context of a local gathering of believers. You know, when the word church is used in the scripture, it's used in a group like this, a gathering of believers that have gathered together to celebrate Jesus Christ. And so that, uh, you know, the New Testament teaches and, and assumes that you would be a part of a local body of believers. I've heard people argue that you can be a Christian and not go to church. 
I think, you know, I've, I've shared this with you guys before. Certainly, you know, people say, well, I can be a Christian and not go to church. You know, my, my response to them is always the same. Uh, I can be married and not go home. But it doesn't help the relationship. You know, we, we need to build and, and grow that relationship. And we grow that by participation in the fellowship of believers. Look what the writer of Hebrews implores the believers in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And he says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. See, one of the benefits of meeting together is encouragement. Please note that it did not say discouragement, but it said encouragement. Have you ever been around people that are so discouraging? Isn't it awful to be around someone that all, they always have something negative to say? We need to encourage one another. So today, here's your um, take home. On your way out of church today, I want you to say something encouraging to someone. Now, someone other than me, okay? I know you'll shake my hand and try to give me a word of encouragement, and that, that's fine, but you got to give encouragement to someone else other than me. And what I want you to do is start making that a life habit. Start making that a habit to be an encourager to other people. There is great value in coming together and being together. And as a, 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 a Christian, without a church is a contradiction. We need to be together. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to be a part of this local body. I know that there's a number of great churches out there right, right in the Beaverton community and, and throughout Gladwin County. There's a lot of great churches. Find a church that believes the Word of God. That's so important, that, that believes and teaches God's Holy Word and be a part of a community. The early church understood this, and they did things together, and, and their lives were intertwined and connected with one another. One of the things that I've always wanted to see or visit was the Redwood Forest in California. I don't, has anybody ever been there before? They've seen the big, giant redwoods? Okay. Uh, a, a few of you have, and, and uh, big, huge, massive trees. I, my family was talking about maybe taking a trip to California someday. I'd, I'd love to see this forest. In fact, I, I saw that um, on the internet some pictures of the forest, and, and they actually have some of the trees that uh, the road goes right through the middle of them. I don't know if anybody's ever seen these. They're so huge that you can actually drive a car through a hole that's been cut right through the middle of a tree. That's amazing. I've, Never seen, you know, the biggest I've ever seen a tree is, is about like this, and that's not even close for driving a car through. And one of the things that we know about, about trees is that the, that the higher they grow, the deeper the roots need to go down in order to give them stability in, in, in the heavy winds. And, and the thing that I found is that in the redwood forest, this is, this is not necessarily true. That the redwood forest has a uh, a very shallow root system as compared to the size of, of, of the tree. The roots don't go down very deep. You know, we would think that these huge trees, they're, they're so big, they must go miles down into the earth, but it's not so. You see, with the redwood trees, their root system is interconnected. And so if a redwood tree had grown to such a large proportion you know, by itself, it would easily topple over. But when it gains structure and support of the other redwood forests and their, their, their roots intertwine with one another so they give stability to one another, it's able to withstand the heavy winds. I think for us today, oftentimes we can be like the redwood. Certainly we want our spiritual roots to be you know, strong and deep, but we also can interconnect with those that are strong as well, and together we can be stronger than if we were apart. It's time to change the way that we think about church and our church family. 
Uh, church is is not this, you know, what we see around us, this, this building. Uh, church is not programs or a time slot. It's not another thing to add to the schedule. Sometimes we get stuck in the thinking that church is a once a week, uh, one, a one hour long commitment. You know, we may enjoy it. We may love seeing the people that we are surrounded by. You know, we may um, sometimes get in the habit of, of categorizing church with like uh, little league and, and work and, and church and, and uh, other activities. You know, it just becomes part of our schedule of what we do. But it's meant to be so much more. There's an author named Randy Frazee. Uh, he writes in his book, The Connecting Church. He says this, The experience of authentic community is one of the purposes God intends to be fulfilled by the church. The writings of scripture lead one to conclude that God intends the church not to be uh, one more bolt of the will of activity in our lives, but the very hub at the center of one's life. And so the early church made no distinction between church and life. They were not in separate categories or separate compartments, but they were one and the same. And what I want to do is, is, is look on in, in, in the scripture here at the togetherness of this church. First, when did they meet? Well, if we look at verse 46, it says they met every day. They came up community because they met every day. Where did they meet? Continue to look there in, in verse 46. It says, uh, you know, of course they met in the temple courts, but it also says that they met in their homes. If you read the rest of verse 46, it says they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They opened their homes and ate together. You know, one of the greatest things that I do throughout the week is, is uh, I enjoy our men's Bible study group where we go over to uh, Dick Alby's house every Wednesday morning for a Bible study. And, and uh, you know, we have a time of fellowship and a sharing with, with one another. And I thought, wow, this is so awesome. And, and I've been talking with a number of people about getting some other groups going. And I know there's, uh, you know, some that need a nighttime group to be a part of. How, how wonderful, how much um, growth has taken place within these men that have gathered together to share their life experiences with one another. I know the women have a group that meets as well. We have Sunday school groups that meet as well. But I think there's something special about being in each other's homes and sharing with one another, having a meal together and eating together. Why? Why do we do this? Well, they were together each day. They were together in, in the church and in their homes and and, and now we ask the question, why? Why did they come together? If you go through the entire New Testament and look at the things that the early church did together and accomplished together, it's, it's quite an impressive list. And I, I want to read some of those for you here this morning. They met together. They prayed together. They ate together. They consulted and advised one another. They planned together. They witnessed together. They encouraged together. They shared what they had together. They strategized together. They handled conflict together. They worked together. They stood against attack together. And the list goes on and on. We can see that they were together. The second building block that we see here in verse 44 is common ground. You know, what do the believers have in common? Everything. You know, they were, they were not clones. There was tremendous diversity within their group, but they had everything together. One of the things that I like to say is we want unity, not uniformity. That, that means there can be differences in our personalities. There can be differences in our spiritual gifts. There can be differences in our likes and dislikes. We don't all have to like the same type of music. We don't all have to wear the same type of clothes. I, I was looking this morning and as uh, people were coming in and gathering to worship, the diversity in the, in the style of clothing. I even commented on Tom Johnson this morning wearing a hoodie to church. 
as if maybe that was appropriate wear to come to church in, wearing a hoodie and blue jeans. I don't know, but I think that the Lord loves him just the same. I, I love the diversity that takes place within our church. You know, I see Ron's got a suit and tie on this morning. Looking sharp. He's a commissioner. He's got to look good. <laughs> He's political. You know, there's all, all these, um, all, all this diversity that takes place. We have seniors and we have uh, young people and, and, and we all join together in perfect unity without uniformity. All right? Do we understand that? That there's a difference between being unified and everybody being the same. I know that there are some that theologically we have differences in our opinions and we get together and we discuss and, and, and we talk and we debate and we argue. Well, no, we don't argue. But at the end, we can come together in unity. I like what it says in Ephesians 4.1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. When we have these differences, because we'll have differences, be completely humble and gentle. When, when you disagree with me as your pastor, come to me humbly and gently. I'll tell you what, I'll receive your criticism a lot better if you come to me in that way, and, and so will others. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One more. One faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. What, what do we have? What's our common ground? Well, we have a common story. Our common story is this. I once was lost, but now I'm found. That's our, that's our story. I mean, if you are a believer and you are gathered here today, if, any, if we don't have anything else in common, we, we have that. We were lost and dead in our sin, but Jesus resurrected us and put us on the rock. And that's our story. We also have a common calling. We are called to holiness and obedience. And sometimes we get there differently. Some of us move faster, some of us move slower, but that is our common. And we have a common goal. Our common goal is this. That you will have your eyes this morning on building the kingdom of God. So often we get caught up in methods and styles and programs and, and disagreeing and, and fighting on how to build God's kingdom. That's one of the ways that we see so often in today's society that churches will be split right down the middle over an issue that might not even be that important because they didn't have unity, that they weren't being humble when they come together. See, that's why community is so important for us here today. I'm not saying that you have to like everything, but I am asking that you understand that we have a common goal and weigh everything that we do against that goal rather than our personal preferences. I'll tell you, I don't always get everything that I want within the church. But, and I don't get mad and upset and complain about it. Why? Because I want to keep a sense of community. Now, today, for closing, we, we see what community is all about. Community is us together holding hands around the cross of Christ. I had thought this morning that maybe we would end uh, by just circling up and holding hands, but then when I started hearing about everybody that's sick, <laughs> I decided maybe we better not do that.
spread those germs to everybody. But I, I do want us to have a sense of community here this morning. So that we would come together and in spite of all our differences, that we would be unified around the cross of Jesus Christ. I want to have a prayer for you this morning, and I'd like for you to bow your head and close your eyes. And this morning, you might be on the outside of the circle looking in. I think if we were to break the circle of unity here this morning, that we should only break it for one purpose, that we would break the circle in order to allow somebody else to join in on the circle. That should be the only thing that would break the community unity at this church. And so I wonder if there is someone on the outside of the community looking in today and I'd like to invite you to be a part of a loving, unified community. With all heads bowed and, and eyes closed, I'd like you to just reflect upon that for a moment. And if there'd be someone here today that would be willing, interested in receiving Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, the Lord of their life, the master of their life's plan. Would you just slip up your hand this morning? Is there anybody like that? I don't want to embarrass anybody today, but uh, could you be okay? See one. Is there any others? Any others that would be interested in receiving Jesus and becoming part of the community of faith? I want to have a prayer for you and Certainly all those that are here today could uh, join in with this prayer. And if you're wanting to receive Jesus, that you would uh, believe this in your heart as well. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning knowing, Lord, that we have been born into a life of sin. And Lord, that we are born separate from you. And Lord, we do not have a uh, community relationship with the Father by default, but Lord, it's only by choice that we receive Jesus Christ, that we become part of this Christian community. And so we thank you, Lord, for inviting us, and for Lord, we know it's at your invitation that we're here today. We may think someone else invited us here, but Lord, it was your Holy Spirit that called and prompted us to be into your house. And so, Lord, I pray for each and every individual that they would accept and be a part of this community of believers. Uh, Lord, and we just pray that we would confess that, that we would share it, that we would give a testimony of what Jesus has done. And we pray all this in your precious name, your Lord. All God's people say. Amen. Well, remember, you're going to give somebody encouragement, could you? Stand and turn to those around you and offer a word of encouragement today. Be a part of the community. God bless you. You are so good.